Number two, modern practice using perverted manuscripts. Again, Dr. Jones enlightens us. The manuscripts produced by these early non-believers were, in modern times, mandated for use. Wait a minute. The manuscripts produced by Origen and his associates, what did they do? He took a staff of 70 with him, roamed around the country. At least seven of those were virgins. Mm -hmm. That is, they were virgins when they started out. But they were his roommates. Does that sound like a televangelist or something? <laughs> and I'm not condemning, well, I am condemning anyone who practices that. There are some good televangelists, but you, gotta, you have to watch who you listen to. So he had at least a committee of 70. And he would go to a church and say, are you using your Bible? Oh, yes, yeah, so it's almost worn on. Okay, I'll copy it for you. So he would copy it, take the old one, and they would have a brand new one. But when they, and then he would disappear and destroy the old one. And that is recorded in history. So when they started reading the new one, certain passages were left out, especially passages having to do with the deity of Jesus Christ and the bodily resurrection. Do you know the only way you're going to be guaranteed that your body is going to come out of the grave? The only way you're guaranteed that is because Jesus arose from the grave. He is our only hope. So Origen would take his 70 and scribes, I mean, in a matter of days, they could copy the entire New Testament and, and give it and then disappear and destroy the old one. So they left out some of Matthew 26. Wow, they, they left out uh, Kamal Johannium, that is the Trinity passage. They left out other key passages. And so finally, the early church caught on to them, and they wouldn't use their Bibles. So they pigeonholed those and said, just they're not worth reading because you're not sure what you're reading about. Some passage will be left out that is central to the deity of Jesus Christ. So they were pigeonholed. Well, centuries ago, two of these that we're going to introduce in a moment were found. Well, they were old. They dated back to at least the second century or the third century because uh, <coughs> Origen died 254. They dated back to the third century. But they didn't have 1 John 5, 7. They didn't have other key passages in them. So enter two men who affected history. The manuscripts produced by these early non-believers were in modern times mandated for use by Brooke Foss Westcott, 1825 to 1903, and Fenton John Anthony Hort, 1828 to 1892, to non-Christian Anglican ministers. Now, it doesn't matter whether they're Anglican, Methodist, Baptist, Adventist, Catholic, whatever. If they don't believe Jesus is the Son of God, they're non-believers. I know some Baptist and Methodist who don't believe Jesus to be the Son of God. Shame on them. You're right. You're right. Okay, two non-Christian Anglican ministers, as they guided the Revision Committee of 1871 to 1881, into translating the English Revised Version. These men guided. They insisted on the inclusion, the honorable inclusion, of two manuscripts. These are the two manuscripts. Well, first, here are the two men. The efforts of these infidelic theologians, for they were infidels. If you do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God, John said, you're an infidel. The efforts of these infidelic theologians resulted in the acceptance of the Codex Sinaiticus Aleph and Codex Vaticanus B as older, superior manuscripts, when in fact these manuscripts survive from antiquity only because they were shunned by early Christian leaders as having been corrupted by Origen et al., his colleagues. And we're quoting Dr. Floyd Nolan Jones. Uh, and he has the historical references uh, at the bottom. So here are the, here's Westcott and Hort. And that's a photograph 
the exterior cover, the copy, the originals are in the Vatican, Codex Sinaiticus, that's Olive, Codex Vaticanus, B, and they essentially say the same thing, leaving out key passages.